All right, so good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, for those of you who are new, my name is Bob Bruner. I am the a &R Extension Educator for Clay and Owen Counties in Indiana. Um, and this is the third session in our Fall Forestry Series. This will be the last one of this series. Uh, tonight, we are going to be talking a little bit about maples, one of our other favorite trees here in Indiana. Now, maples are really prized for their landscaping quality. There are very few trees that reach quite as many brilliant colors as maples, and they have a variety of shapes that can make them really, really useful. Um, a lot of the species, as it says here, are ideal for lawns, hedges, or as shade trees. Uh, I'm sure a lot of us grew up with at least one maple in close proximity to where you live that you could actually enjoy. Um, I've seen a variety of maples of different shapes. There's one lady's home I visited in one of my counties who had a maple tree that had a near perfectly spherical shape, which I thought was just really neat. She had to be taking really good care of it. And of course, we love maples for their colors. They can get all kinds of very, very brilliant, very obvious colors, especially this time of year. Probably very shortly, all of our maples are going to just become fireworks on display all over this area of Indiana. One of the great things about maples is that they're also very resilient. They can survive several different hardiness zones. Um, and, I mean, obviously they're all the way up in Canada, so much that they have that as a part of their flag. And they go all the way to the southern portion of the United States. So they can be just about everywhere in the country. Their size can vary quite a bit and their growth rates can vary quite a bit. So when you're wanting to use maples, you need to be sure of the species that you're choosing for your landscaping because that's going to influence how quickly you're gonna be able to take advantage of it and enjoy it. Um, for the most part though, maples seem to be very, very good choices for those things. So there are a few ideal growing conditions for maples to consider. So maples do have some tendency to like moisture conditions that are relatively high. Uh, which can make them a little bit more successful. Like if you live in a river valley like I do, or if you live in bottom areas where you might get some more water movement, maples will probably still be relatively successful. Um, red and silver maples tend to be the two groups that like, or the two species, I'm sorry, that like wet environments. While there are also several other species that may be able to tolerate moderate drought. So you've got a pretty good spread there when it comes to um, being able to tolerate those conditions. I see we've got a question here. Uh, what maple is dropping seeds in the last few weeks? Uh, Patty, I actually, I do not know which one is doing it. I mean, we have plenty of red and silver maple throughout the area. So I, honestly, you could probably make a pretty safe bet that it's going to be one of them that's doing it. Um, I have not seen many maple seeds dropping right by me right now. so. I'll have to just take a look and see what's going on before I could give you a good answer on that one. Uh, back to our ideal growing conditions though. So ideal soil for maples is going to be relatively well drained with high organic compounds in it or high organic content. And the soil is going to need to be fairly porous to allow the roots to get good spread and to help that water drain out. So while they can tolerate wet conditions, um, they still shouldn't be sitting in water all the time. That's just going to cause root rots and all sorts of other problems. However, they are capable of thriving in a fairly wide pH range, which if you guys recall some of the trees that I've talked about in our previous sessions, some of them had pretty tight pH ranges that they needed to be able to live in. But with a maple, um, they, they tend to like slightly acidic soils, but they can survive a lot of pH ranges, which makes them really good for a variety of residential landscapes because our proximity to say if you live in a town you may get a little bit different variety in that pH range whether you're close to a road or not and that just means that maples might be a good choice because they can survive those changes and be able to adapt fairly easily. Now there are a few issues that come with maples um, and unfortunately some of them kind of are major ones if you've had to deal with them before. Maple trees tend to bleed. Um, their bleeding doesn't necessarily mean it's indicative of a disease, though it can be. Um, maples tend to bleed during temperature shifts when the sugar content in their vascular system is very high. And if there's a heavy temperature shift and some of that vascular system breaks to open air, 
the tree will begin to bleed. It doesn't necessarily mean that the tree is dying. It doesn't mean that the tree is really even that injured. This is a natural defensive reaction maples have. Um, and it's just a way that their bodies handle the sugar content going through it. If you prune, at, uh, sometimes at the wrong time, you'll prune a limb and then the tree will just bleed quite literally like you cut a limb off. Um, do not panic. You, that doesn't mean the tree is going to die. It's not ideal, but it is something that we just see with maples quite a bit. Um, maple bark tends to be brittle and it's easily damaged. That's the bleeding issues that you may see. So if with that brittle bark on the outside, that means that maples may be susceptible to disease due to injury. So that's something to consider if you have a maple in your lawn where you're mowing grass or using a weed eater or weed whacker, um, you wanna make sure you're careful around that tree because if you accidentally score or damage that bark on the lower portion of the trunk, uh, you could create a problem for that tree. Another issue that we often see with maples is much like with our oak trees that we talked about last week, the feeding roots remain close to the surface. So you can find lots of really, really good pictures. Um, oftentimes these pictures are taken by professional photographers because of how aesthetically pleasing they are, where the roots are, are actually on the surface and going into the soil. And it makes a great image, but unfortunately it makes managing the turf surrounding the maple kind of challenging. And again, there's that danger of if you're mowing your lawn, if you're doing any kind of uh, yard management, you wanna be really careful so you don't damage those roots. Because again, you could create an opening for disease to get in there. So those are just some of the general issues that you have to deal with when you're working with maple. So now I think I wanna talk a little bit about pruning because I did mention this just a moment ago. So when you prune, the tree may begin to bleed from the pruning site if it's done when sap is flowing. And this means that the tree has not yet gone dormant. It means that it's got lots of sugar content within the liquid that's flowing through its vascular system. It's storing up energy. It's probably storing all that energy up for either new growth or to be able to form seeds. Basically what it means is that the tree is not necessarily in any kind of danger. The bleeding probably is a part of its own defensive cycle so that way it can cover up an injury. Um, and it's just because the trees tend to take in so much more sugar. The tree isn't in any danger, but it can be really messy and really unsightly depending on what you're looking for out of that maple. So what I would recommend for pruning is that you want to do this during late summer or early fall. I would say early fall, like right now when the temperature is this cool, I think would be the ideal time to go ahead and do pruning because that sap flow is gonna be pretty low and you should be able to safely prune the tree and the tree won't be brittle yet because of cooler temperatures. So if you waited longer, if it got down to 40 degrees, you, that brittleness in the bark is gonna become all of a sudden a much bigger problem because the flexibility is gone due to the temperature shift. So now is the best time to go ahead and prune. And again, if it bleeds, don't panic. The tree is probably just gonna be fine. It's just what happens with them. All right, so why don't we talk about a few species of maple? I think I've got three species here I wanna cover. Um, the reason I chose them is because these are the maples that I see most commonly. And I wanna start with our red maple. This is probably the most recognizable maple that we have. Um, they have, as you can see from the picture, those leaves tell their own story. I mean, that is what you see on all sorts of pieces of art, you see that leaf and you know instantly you are looking at a maple tree. In this case, it is our red maple. So red maples are really valued for their aesthetic peel and as a great shade tree. They can get big, they grow quick, so they can get very, very large. Um, I don't think I've seen a maple quite as tall as 100 feet, but I've definitely seen some that have gotten past that 40 foot mark and they can get pretty big. They tolerate well-drained and poorly drained soil. So that means that they are really ideal for landscaping situations, no matter where you are. Um, that being said, I would want to remind you when it comes to doing any kind of landscaping with these trees, think about the inclination of the yard you're putting them in. Because if your yard has a steep incline to it and you're planting a maple that has roots close to the surface, you may want to rethink that. Um, their roots are going to be really close, so that means that you may have roots getting ejected out of the soil because of the steep incline. Anyways, um, however, 
as good as red maples are, they do have one problem. If your soil is particularly basic, if its pH is very high, um, it may get magnesium deficiencies occurring. So I always suggest this with any plant, but if you are considering planting a red maple, get a soil test done. Um, and we can take a look at it. Uh, you can always bring it into your extension educator if you don't understand what you're looking at, or you can bring it to a master gardener, you know. Um, we could take a look at these things. We can help you try to understand what we're reading and what we're going through. So don't be afraid to do that. They're relatively cheap, rarely goes above $15 to get it done. All right, so for our next species, let's talk a little bit about Japanese maple. Now this one I have heard arguments about. Um, part of that argument is that Japanese maples, they're not native. They, the name's accurate, they are Asian in origin. However, they are not what we call an invasive species. An invasive species, the reason they are problems is because when they enter our environment, there are no natural com uh, competitors with them. There are no natural enemies that can control them. So they will develop out of control and eventually push out all other organisms that are like them. However, the Japanese maple is what we call an introduced species. No, it is not native. However, it does not outcompete everything in its native environment. They're actually very, very easily managed. Um, they don't seed that often, or at least not successfully that often. So if you don't want them to spread, you could just easily look out for the seedlings developing and pull them. And you're probably not gonna have much problem with it. Honestly, I've had some terrible luck trying to grow Japanese maples before because sometimes I just have that. So I'd be happy if I got a seedling to go. Um, these trees though, they are a little bit more difficult than our other maples. They are restricted to zones five and six. So they will not do well if it's particularly warmer, particularly cooler. Um, and you want to make sure that you plant them away from harsh winds because if they get blasted by those cold winter winds, they're going to die back. Um, I've actually had several clients who I've worked with who didn't understand why these maples were dying. And it was, it was simply because they were trying to use them as a kind of windbreak. And they got nailed by that really cold wind that we can get some winters. And of course, they had dieback. The, you could see the bark began to blacken and no new leaves developed. Um, they really do kind of require that optimal soil and partial shade to get their development really going. Uh, this is probably because they aren't native to this area, they're not native to this environment, so they're going to need some babying to be able to be successful. However, um, in my personal opinion, Japanese maples are really nice to look at. They're a very pretty tree, and another reason I like them is because you could plant them with no guilt. They're not going to be pushing out anything they're not gonna be damaging your environment. They are just a pretty tree that needs a little bit extra management. Okay, another one that we know very, very well is our silver maple. This is another very common one in Indiana. And this one always sticks out because the undersides of silver maple leaves have that silvery sheen. Now, make sure you don't confuse this for another tree that has a silvery sheen, such as autumn olive. So I'm gonna go back to that last image real quick. Make sure you use this as your example of a maple leaf. Remember that lobed appearance, the kind of, the way it kind of resembles the leaf you see on the Canadian flag. This is the thing you want there. If you have a silvery sheen and the leaves don't look like this, double check what it is. We don't want autumn olive to spread. I've actually worked with a few clients who didn't quite understand that. We had to help them with their local environment. So this tree was once prized for its aesthetic appeal. It was planted relatively commonly, but now it's a little bit less frequent because like a lot of maples, they're softer and it has a tendency to break. So if you recall, we've had several winters where temperatures got very, very low. And for a tree like the silver maple, that is not a good combination. They will break, they will shatter under extreme colder temperatures and they just will not survive those environments which is why people have kind of moved away from them. Now, if you could protect them from that cold, like if you've got good windbreaks already going and the tree isn't being just subjected to all the environmental harshness, they can be a really good choice for landscapes if you have wet or poorly drained conditions. They will survive that experience and they will thrive. So they can actually be a really excellent shade tree. 
And of course, like it says down there, they're really easily identified. You just look for that maple leaf shape and then you check the underside of the leaf and that silvery sheen will always be there. So these are yet another example of a tree that I really, really like. So I wanna cover, like I do with all these, some of the diseases that we deal with in maple. Now the good news is, is that for the most part, none of these diseases are gonna kill a tree. That's the great thing about these trees. However, they can make them look a little unsightly. So I wanna cover um, a little bit of what they look like to help you understand what you see and to not panic. So the first one, you guys have heard me talk about this one before. Um, this is anthracnose. These will have different effects depending on the tree here. I've listed a few of, uh, a, a couple of them. Um, Norway maple, when anthracnose is present, you're gonna see brown to purple streaking along the veins of the leaf and it'll be very, very obvious. Um, you'll, it will definitely make, the leaves will definitely show a very big difference between its normal appearance and this. If you're looking at a sugar maple, you're gonna see irregular brown areas on and between leaf veins that are going to be very similar to drought symptoms. And then eventually what you'll see are these little tiny brown fruiting structures that develop along the affected areas. And what you do for this one is I can sometimes see these with the naked eye, but it really helps to have a hand lens handy if you're trying to figure out what's wrong with a leaf. Um, I definitely recommend investing in one. You can take that hand lens and just take a closer look at the leaves and you will be able to see these little structures on them um, that'll they'll look kind of like tiny little stalks with a bead at the end of them. Those will be the fruiting structures of the anthracnose fungus. Now the good news is, is that this is not one of the species that anthracnose can kill. Um, what they'll do is they'll just use it to reproduce, but they won't really do much damage to the tree. So what I'd recommend here is that maple won't experience major losses due to anthracnose, however your other trees might. So if your maple gets infected, make sure you clean up all the leaves on the ground. Don't leave them sitting there because you don't want this to spread to say your dogwood or any other trees that are nearby that can suffer way more damage than a maple will. Here's just a couple of example images. Um, oh, the last name on there is supposed to be Nicholas J. Breeze. I'll have to, Breezy, I'll have to collect, correct that later. Um, this just shows a really good example of what the anthracnose damage looks like on maple leaves. And you can see really clearly those irregular brown areas in between the leaf margins. Some of the leaf margins are part of those brown areas. Um, but again, it just makes the leaves look a little bad, but it's not dangerous to the tree. So you don't have to worry. All right, bacterial leaf scorch is another one that we see in maple fairly often. Um, this one's a little bit easier to identify in my opinion because of some of the ways those uh, affected areas look. So what happens is you're going to see browning of the leaves in localized areas on individual branches. This is a bacterial infection, not a fungus. So it's going to be limited in the way it can travel throughout the tree's system. So it's mainly going to be fairly localized unless it's a very, very bad infection. I just, I haven't honestly seen very many of those. Usually symptoms are going to appear in late July. So what you're going to see are brown areas defined by kind of a narrow red band and a yellow halo. Ultimately, you may see some leaf loss in August. Now you can lose trees due to bacterial leaf scorch, but it has to be a fairly bad infection. I, like I said, I don't personally see that very often. So let's take another look at the, what the infection looks like when it's present. So we've got a pair of leaves here Look at the margins of the affected areas where you see the yellow and then you see that dark line separating it from green like on the leaf on the left side there. Those are the halos and the red areas that I was just referring to. And that's basically the, the uh, leaf is dying from the infection. There's probably some hypernecrotic reactions going in there. Um, but mainly what you're doing is you wanna look for that nice red line in between the, the uh, yellowed or browned area and the green areas. And that'll tell you that it's bacterial leaf sc scorching. All right, this disease is perhaps one that um, I think is the one I get the most calls on because people consider it the worst one. Again, we don't really face a whole lot of diseases that are going to kill trees. Mainly they're just going to make them look bad though. Bleeding canker I think can cost trees if it gets particularly bad. And it really is exactly what it sounds like. The tree will look like it's bleeding. Excuse me. 
Uh, the canker will develop underneath the bark, which will then become sunken as that canker continues to develop. Eventually, the sunken area is going to become reddish, and you're going to see sap beginning to leak out. The final stage of this disease, this is when it gets really bad and it can cost you a tree, is you're going to see the leaves fall off and the, leaves, the limbs are going to experience dieback. So let's take a closer look at this. So bleeding canker is really well named. Um, it honestly looks like somebody stabbed the tree with a knife and it just started bleeding out. I mean, it's awful looking. It can really, really kill the aesthetic quality of the tree. And unfortunately, if it's a bad enough disease, it can kill the tree eventually. Now, I haven't mentioned while I've been talking to these diseases about any kind of management. For the most part, you don't need to worry. Most management really isn't necessary because most of these diseases are not going to cost you a tree. But on occasion, they can get bad enough where you may want to consider taking action. Bleeding canker, there may not be very good things to do. If you lose a tree to bleeding canker or bacterial scorch for that matter, you should remove the tree. And then I would avoid replanting in those areas for a couple of years to make sure that the pathogens are fully gone from that area. Um, because for example, with bleeding canker, with a lot of fungal diseases, we would normally recommend just apply a fungicide and you'll be okay. Well, you're not going to be able to apply a fungicide underneath the bark of the tree without paying a pretty significant amount of money, probably more than you're willing to. So I would suggest either just writing that tree off and removing it as soon as it dies or contacting an arborist to help you manage these problems. Because um, they're just the, the management options are something that you really need to take a close look at. Is it really going to be worth it? Is it really going to be necessary? And then make your decision from there. All right, so on to my favorite part. Um, you guys know it. I'm an entomologist. I love talking about my bugs. So we're going to cover a few insect pests of maple. Um, this is another great part of this because there really aren't too many insect pests that cause lasting damage to maple. Uh, again, they can get a little unsightly, but for the most part, the tree is probably going to be fine. The first one I'm going to cover here are our aphid species. Right now, the image you're looking at is a woolly alder aphid. So they look like these, you might think that these were scales. They are not scales, they can actually move around. They're just aphids that are kind of lumpy looking and they have a little bit of fuzz coming off of them. But they are fairly common on, uh, aphid species are fairly common on maple. So again, you guys have probably heard me talk about aphids plenty before, but I'll just go over it again. These are a sap feeding species. And once they start feeding, they don't really move a whole lot. Normally what aphids do is they find a good spot to begin feeding. They'll insert their mouth parts. They're called, a, it's called a rostrum. It's kind of like a syringe into the vascular system of the tree. And they're just going to start draining out the sap from the tree. Um, it takes them a while to be able to get the rostrum in there and reach where they want to feed. So once they start feeding, they are going to be stuck there until they choose to finish because they can't move with their mouth parts still in the tree. Uh, that means that removing them is actually fairly easy. You can just wipe them off and they'll, they'll die pretty much after that. Um, I'm mentioning woolly alder aphids here, but there are actually several species of aphids that can attack maple. And what they'll do is they will damage the leaves, branches, new shoots, but it's rarely anything serious. There might be some leaf shriveling, there might be minor dieback. But ultimately, aphids are going to hit your maples, and they're really not going to do a whole lot of damage. They may just be a little unsightly, and you'll have to deal with the honeydew that the aphids produce. So usually what I would recommend to work with aphids is to encourage natural enemies to feed on them. Aphids are like popcorn to predators. They're easy to eat. They don't run. So lots of lady beetles and other kinds of insects will eat them all the time. And the easiest way to do that is to encourage an environment that has a good amount of diversity in it, and that will encourage the natural enemies to move in and feed on them. Um, large infestations can be quite expensive to manage versus the benefit you would get. So you'll have to kind of balance your decision on managing them, um, because if you want to apply enough pesticide to get rid of them, depending on the height of the tree, you're going to need a professional to come out and help you. And oftentimes, it may just be more expensive than really the benefit you get out of getting them removed. 
because once the pesticide work is done, they're probably going to come right back. Um, in my opinion, the best solution for this is just tolerating the damage year after year, and the maple will most likely survive. So scales are another one that are typically a major problem on a lot of tree species, including maple. Again, they aren't probably going to kill a tree or even do that much damage, but they tend to be kind of unsightly. And there are a lot of scale species that will attack maple and trees in general. Um, I'm not going to bore you guys by going over all of them in this one program, and I'm more than happy to help you out if you think you've got some. Um, scales generally aren't limited to a single plant host. They'll use a lot, whole bunch of different species, including our maples. They'll also vary in appearance quite a bit. You're going to see scales that will appear very flat, and you're going to see scales that look like they're covered in a cottony substance. And of course, some of them look like scales. Like aphids, they can also exude honeydew. But here's the thing. Aphids, while they don't move much, they will move. They will remove their mouth parts and eventually walk away to find another spot to feed. Once a scale settles into its location, it's stuck there. It won't move again for the rest of its life. The scales that you see stuck to trees are generally the female of the species. The males will move around and they'll mate with the females. So the best time to manage scales are going to be when the crawlers are out, the newborn scales that have hatched and are beginning to find new locations to try to feed on. Natural enemies can help you out, ants, lady beetles, all kinds of other species, but scales, they're built, they're kind of built very armored, so they can be tough, tough to get rid of for natural enemies. Physical removal is going to be best for your lighter infestations. A lot of scales, you can just flat out scrape right off a tree. I mean, they aren't stuck there that hard, but they can be challenging. Um, don't try to use a pesticide unless there are crawlers present. You can't apply a pesticide to adult scales and expect any really good effect on them because they are stuck there and they are covered in armor or that cottony substance they're covered with is going to protect them really well. So keep that in mind if you're thinking about spraying for scales. All right, so one of our last insects I think we're gonna talk about are our gall makers. These are not just insects that do that. This is a combination of insects and mites that form galls, either due to oviposition when they're laying their eggs or during their feeding. They'll create some kind of reaction within the leaf itself that's a little bit like cancer, forming a benign tumor in the leaf. If the insect is laying its eggs there, what'll happen is the gall will form and it'll house the egg and then the larva will hatch inside that gall and use it as a feeding source, a feeding substrate. Um, other insects may just form it, do, or other animals, I should say, will form them just a part of how they feed. Galls can take a lot of different shapes. They can look like little spindly fingers coming off the surface of the leaf, or they can look like bumps or other shapes that are coming off of the surface. Normally what you'll see is that one side of the leaf will be depressed due to the action of either egg laying or feeding. And if we look at this image, we're kind of seeing there is a bump there and kind of a depression as well. Um, and then the other side of it will actually have the gall itself. And that's where either the insect egg will be or where the mite is feeding, etc. Galls and the insects that create them, for the most part, are generally harmless. They're not causing any realistic permanent damage. The damage is going to be solely to the leaf. Um, it is going to be kind of unsightly, but that's really about all there is to it. They're not causing really any kind of problem. Um, normally, what I see, and I kind of put it here in the slide, is it causes the owner more stress than it does the tree. So uh, don't worry if you see galls form on your leaves. That doesn't mean the tree is in trouble. That just means nature is kind of taking its course with things. All right, that is what I had for you guys this evening. Thank you for coming by and spending your evening with me. Um, I've got my contact information right here, so please feel free to give me a call or email me. And also take a stop by our Purdue Ed store, which is our big archive of all kinds of publications that talk about problems with trees, other plants, insects, etc and our Purdue Plant and Pest Diagnostic Laboratory, which can help you diagnose diseases and other issues with your plants.